Hi there. You know, this is what's left of Reed Halliday. 13 years ago, I was a lot younger and I had more hair and so uh, it's, it, I could be a hologram today and you know, it's kind of what's left of me, but look, uh, my wife and I are uh, uh, delighted and honored to be a part of um, what you're doing here. And we started this uh, lecture series a while back because I was impressed by people who came in from the community who uh, actually did things. And uh, different than a professor, and they're all smart and talented and qualified, but you got people from the outside who came in who had actually been there, done it, and inspired me. And I kept saying, if that guy can do it, maybe I got a chance to do it. So if what I say to do you today, and you say, if that guy could do it, maybe I've got a chance to go to do something. I want to mention two more guests here, the Paximans, Shirley and Monroe. I uh, hung out with their, uh, one of their sons and one of their daughters uh, night and day in high school, and um, they tell me they come to every one of these lecture series. I would think they have better things to do, but uh, they come to every one of these, and uh, Mr. Paxman, Brother Paxman, turns 95 next week. So I saw him walking down the stairs with his big staff, and I said, he looks like Gandalf coming down the stairs here. But wonderful people and who have survived and who also make a big contribution and have over these years to this school and to the community. Uh, Dean Wright mentioned that I'm involved at BYU and I'm also involved here and have been here for probably 20 years involved in both schools. But I will tell you that uh, the exciting place to be involved is here at UVU. And I remember the school when it was two green buildings, long kind of buildings on, Ut on University Avenue in Provo. And it was sort of the trade tech is what we called it. And so um, I go back a long ways in Provo and I remember that specifically. And then of course here we are today, it's a remarkable school with no small renown. You've got 30,000 30, plus students this beautiful, beautiful campus, and they've got the fountains turned on today. I don't know if it's the first time, but that's the first time I'm seeing them. And very forward-thinking leaders. I work with President Holland, and uh, I'll tell you, we're all lucky to have a man like that who has the vision, experience, and the drive to get things done. So um, uh, I think uh, that's wonderful. I was just, just going to say about my sister, probably the biggest claim to fame for this school is that she's taught English here and um, in the business department and the communications department for 25 years. So um, I don't know if you've had her, but if you haven't had the experience as a freshman or junior, uh, sophomore, you should probably look her up. Mickey Cote, she'll take care of you because she likes uh, students. So look, that's uh, kind of my introduction to the world here, a, a little bit of, and we're gonna talk a little bit about me, but and we'll answer some questions here in just a few minutes. You can ask questions and I'll try and answer them. But first, let's, uh, uh, I've got some remarks I want to talk about. I want to talk, first of all, about Sir Edmund Hillary. So, um, and his quote, he says, well, George, uh, we knock the bastard off, Elry, uh, Edmund Hillary said to George Lowe, his companion who stayed at base camp, as Edmund and his loyal Sherpa, Tenzing Norgay descended from the top of Mount Everest, uh, just having accomplished what no other, no other person in the world had done. It was 11.30 a.m. on May the 29th, 1953, that the summit was conquered. Between 1920 and 1952, seven major expeditions had failed to reach the summit of Mount Everest. In Hillary's ascent, all but two climbers from the group turned back after they reached the South Peak, leaving only Hillary and Norgay to go all the way. In his words, uh, Sir Edmund Hillary said, not that I wasn't excited to reach the top of the world. I remember when Tenzing and I faced the icy, narrow final ridge to the top. Some on our team had predicted the ridge would be impossible to climb, but it didn't look so bad to us. After attaching fresh oxygen bottles to our masks, the old way of doing it, we set off. I led the way, hacking a line of steps with my ice axe. 
After about an hour, we came to a 40-foot high rock buttress barring our path. Quite a problem at nearly 29,000 feet. A nice cornice was overhanging the rock on the right with a long crack inside it. Beneath the cornice, the mountain fell away at least 10,000 feet to the Gangsheng Glacier. A gl a glacier. Would the cornice hold if I tried to go up? There was only one way to find out. Jamming my crampons into the ice behind me, I somehow wriggled my way to the top of the crack, using every handhold I could find. For the first time, I felt confident that we were going to make it all the way. To the right, I saw a rounded snow dome and, cutting, and kept cutting steps upward. In less than an hour, I reached the crest of the ridge with nothing but space in every direction. Tanzing joined me, it joined me, and to our great delight and relief, we stood on top of Mount Everest. I've always been intrigued by Hillary, uh, and uh, here is why. He tells us in his own words, words, he talks about being on top of Mount Everest. He said, we had one problem that the modern mountaineer doesn't have. That is the psychological barrier. We didn't know if it was humanly possible to reach the top of Everest. We weren't at all sure whether we would drop dead or something of that nature. He discusses his abilities. He says, I knew I wasn't smarter than other kids. I was always a modest student. I was sort of in the middle. I wasn't awful and I wasn't good, but I was adequate. I was never what you would call a great athlete. I have very modest abilities. I'd probably say otherwise, but that's what he said. Motivation, he discusses. With careful planning and good, good motivation, I think you can often achieve things that other much more talented people would probably do much more easily. But then, a lot of these very talented people are not as strongly motivated to carry out the things that I have been involved in. And finally, on fear, he says, and this is for sure for me, fear can be a stimulating factor. With fear, I think you can extend yourself far more than you ever believed possible. And instead of being just a mediocre person for a moment anyway, you become someone of considerable competence. He wasn't smarter than other kids. He was never what you call a great athlete. He was a good planner and highly motivated, and he was stimulated by fear. He sounds pretty ordinary, and yet he accomplished extraordinary things. From Auckland, New Zealand, his occupation was beekeeper. Interesting, right? That great psychologist, Dr. Seuss, begins one of his books. Congratulations, today is your day. You're off to great places, you're off and away. You have brains in your head, you have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself in any direction you choose. You're on your way and you know what you know and you are the guy who will decide where to go. So here you and I are today. You stand on the threshold of a promising future, and you really do. What can I give you that would help you prepare for what is out there? The good news is I have been where you are and have had many of the concerns that you have. The bad news is I can't remember much about it. <laughs> but the more I thought about it, the questions I had when I was about your age were, what am, I, what am I supposed to do in life? What should I have for a profession? Whom should I marry? Where should I live? How do I pay for schooling? And do I graduate from college or do I go to work? The answer to most of these questions is not easy nor is it inconsequential. Most of the questions you are currently facing are life-altering in nature, in nature. They are life-defining decisions. Your life will never be the same depending on which road you take. But before we go there, let me just tell you a little bit more about me, and you can use this to, answer, to ask questions when we get to that time. I was raised about two miles south of here on a chicken farm. I love that analogy. My father was a Provo City policeman, as was my grandfather, as was his father. We eventually sold the farm and purchased a neighborhood grocery store on 800 West Center in Provo uh, that was called Holiday Market. Rather typical, I attended Brigham Young University for a year and went on a mission to France. Return home, returning home, I graduated in political science and French. 
Three years after graduating, I went back to BYU and got my MBA. I, like so many others, found my sweetheart there and, named, and married her, Chris Smith. We have, as Norm says, four children, 12 grandchildren, and live in Newhall, California. Directly out of graduate school, I joined Goldman Sachs, uh, the international banking firm based in New York. One of the great firms on Wall Street, it, was, it is a recognized leader in most of its areas. While I was there, we created the largest and most successful team in the world doing business with very wealthy individuals, offering them customized investment management and brokerage services, and we were based in Los Angeles. My team did business with some of the wealthiest people in the world. The list of clients read like a who's who in America. Many of them were great industrialists having made their own money. Some were just lucky, having been born in the right sperm club. Their families had money for many generations. After working at Goldman Sachs for 21 years, I and four other partners left and started our own wealth management business based in Los Angeles called Bel Air Investment Advisors. Today, we manage approximately $7.5 billion for 350 families in Los Angeles and elsewhere in California, as well as Utah, Arizona, Texas, Florida, New York, and a few other places. About 25% of our clients are from the entertainment business, like Barbara Streisand and Madonna and others, and everyone wants to talk about those. Many of our clients are industrialists like the Levy family of Farmers Group and the Stewart family of Carnation Milk. Others are just anonymous faces and names with a lot of money. <clears throat> I want to talk about three decisions that have changed my life over time. So number one, the first decision that changed my life was to marry Chris Smith. We were both 25 when we got married. I met her when I was a freshman at BYU. I remember the first time I saw her, she was practicing her guitar and singing on the old Smith Fieldhouse stage for the Cougarette concert. She was commandant of the Cougarettes and I was freshman class president. It only took me six years to ask her to marry me. I'm a little slow in that regard. The real truth is I left for two years and while I was gone, she graduated from college and started teaching at Orem High School. Chances are she may have taught some of your mothers. Chris was my shrink. About a year before we got married, I would go to her and ask her advice about my girlfriends and dating. Little did, little did I know she was setting me up to marry me, to marry her. That is what I call a good shrink. Many of you are trying to decide whom to date, whom to marry, and every related question. My suggestion is to marry your best friend and your confidant. Marry the person who shares your dreams as well as the person with whom you can weather the inevitable storms. Marrying Chris was the best decision of my life. The second decision that altered my life was going to graduate school. When I was at BYU, I told everyone that I was going to law school. I took the LSAT and got a low score. I thought maybe it was the pizza I ate the night before the test. So I took the exam a second time and got a similar low score. As a senior in college, I was panicked. I applied to seven law schools and received seven rejection letters. Whenever I think I need a little humbling, I pull out those seven letters and read them. So I said to myself, now what do I do? I'm graduating and have no defined future. And some of you here today might feel a little like that uh, in your lives. Prior to graduating, I had invested all the money I had saved with a small group of people, and we started our own fast food restaurant in Orem. It was called the Champ Eating Center. About the time of my graduation, we, f we found uh, we needed a manager for the restaurant. And so I decided to give it a try. How fortuitous for me. I worked for three and a half years, learning about myself mostly and about the business uh, second. I hired and fired people. I flipped hamburgers and made onion rings, met the payroll sometimes, built a second restaurant, created the advertisement, and slowly watched as we lost all of our money. Great experience and great education. Among our faithful clientele were my parents. My parents would come in and eat, and we would talk. And without fail, my mother would say to me, boy, are you stupid, Reed. 
you have got to get out of here and get back to school. I can still hear her words to me. So after my restaurant experience, I, I knew I loved business, and so I went, went back to school and got an MBA at BYU. My wife taught school to support us. My daughter went to the babysitter, and I went to, to class. Much of it I loved, some of it I really hated. It was a very challenging time in our lives, but going to graduate school gave me the advantage I needed. I had six job offers at the end of my second year. Some firms, including Goldman Sachs, will generally only hire graduate students. It, but it was in graduate school that I learned that the smartest guy in the class is not necessarily going to be the most successful. It was in graduate school that I came to know that I was very good in certain subjects and really bad in others. And I learned there was no way I wanted anything to do with statistics. So the third defining decision in my life was starting our own business. While at Goldman Sachs, our team was known for innovation. We were the first to coin the phrase elephant hunting. We going after and capturing the whole account. We were the first to build a large team of professionals. We had built a computerized portfolio system that could monitor clients' portfolios. In 1990, we determined high net worth clients didn't want stockbrokers anymore with conflicts of interest but rather they preferred to have their money managed by professional investment advisors. We asked the partners of Goldman Sachs and they granted us a one-time only franchise, exclusive franchise for an investment advisory business within the brokerage business. We started our, first business, our new business and within four years we had over a billion dollars in assets under fee. However, we were still not content and the other senior member of the team and I had always had a dream to have our own investment advisory business. So in 1997, something happened. We both turned 50 and we looked at each other and said, if we don't do it, do it now, we never will. So, um, and so we told Goldman we were leaving. I will never forget December the 23rd, 1997. Three of us walked out of Goldman Sachs at about 2 p.m. in the afternoon, carrying only our briefcases after having said goodbye to people we had worked with, in some cases, 21 years. We got to the elevator, the door closed, and we leaned back against the wall and said to, our, to each other, what have we done? Uh, that was the beginning of a great adventure. I've never worked harder in my life, nor have I felt better about myself. We hired people, we wrote customer documents, transferred accounts, created marketing brochures, cold called new prospects, and created a real business. In 2000, the stock market was at the frothy part of the dot-com run. There had been multiple back-to-back -back years of 30% plus returns. The Dow Jones was headed to 50,000. By the way, it's at a new high today, 16,800 and some, I think. And some, as some extrapolators said, it was going to 50,000. They just extrapolated out. It was never going to stop. The Dow Jones, uh, in that environment, we had an opportunity to sell our business only two and a half years after we started. We ended up selling 75% of the ownership to State Street Capital out of Boston for much more money than they should have paid, much more than we were worth. We were maybe smart, but we were really lucky because the top of the stock market was that spring and the market declined 50% over the next two years. We worked hard and we stayed the course. Six, six years later, our parent company decided to get out of our business, and so in 2006, we bought our company back for much less than they paid us. At that time, we took the opportunity to distribute equity in the firm to many of the younger, hardworking partners who had diligently helped us build our business. It paid off for them and us when last year we had a chance to sell our firm again. And our new financial partner is a French-Canadian firm by the name of Fiera Capital, which manages about $60 billion in institutional assets for pension accounts in Canada. Our combined goal is to build out the high net worth business in Canada and the United States, and we are just starting to expand with our first office in New York, and it's very exciting for us. Now, a little bit of advice uh, before we, I leave here. Number one, and if you want to write something down, maybe these are the, the advice, uh, the points you would write down. One, 
try to do things just a little differently than others. I learned early in life that a preemie was paid for creativity. Most people are in a rut. I love the element of surprise at dressing up for Halloween, at wearing a tie that creates just a little dissonance. I love to go to new places and see new things. You need to differentiate yourself in today's world if you want to have impact. When we hire someone, we look for the individual who has different hobbies, who has climbed pyramids, who has walked across America, who has built his own car, who has written poetry, who has overcome incredible adversity. The world needs people who look at the same old problem in a new way. So number one, try to do things just a little differently. Number two, pick a career you like and that you're good at. When I was a kid, I saved my money and bought a few stocks. I remember one evening being in the basement of our grocery store, painting signs for the storefront windows, that was my assignment, and listening to the radio and the report of a big oil find in Canada by Texas Gulf Sulphur. I think my stock shares went up 10 points the next day. That was a big deal for a high school kid. I was hooked for life. In choosing my career, I did a self-evaluation. What were my strengths? What were my weaknesses? What was I good at? I didn't want a job where I was paid by the hour or salary. I wanted a job where I was responsible for what I made. If you enjoy what you do, you will be successful. You will, be get, you will get motivated. You will experience less anxiety, and if you're lucky, you might even make a little money. So choose a career you like. Three, surround yourself with people who are smarter than you. When I first interviewed at Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs, I was intimidated by every person I met that day. I'll never forget it. At Bel Air, we hire people who are smarter than we are. This kind of environment causes, us to, causes me to stretch to do better. It challenges my beliefs and thinking. It causes me to have opinions and to defend my point of view. Surround yourself with people who are smarter than you are. Four, work hard. This all sounds so obvious, right? But I, was a very, I, was, I am very serious about this statement. My parents never had the formal education or the money of some other people. But we knew as a family we could, we could outwork at anyone. If we had to, we got up earlier and we worked longer than anybody else. That, by the way, is not the smartest way to get ahead. But it did give me a strong understanding of the value of hard work. So work hard. Five, set goals for yourself. I have read a lot of books on setting goals, and you have as well, probably. I have tried a lot of different programs. I have tried different uh, time planners like all of you, most of which are good and can help us in one way or another. I have tried to spend my life fantasizing about winning rather than fantasizing about losing. I once heard a story about an Olympic skier. Someone asked what he did before each race. He said he tried to visualize the course starting at the finish line and worked his way back up the hill. He saw himself winning, and then he saw what it took to get there. He removed every, every obstacle in his way. He cleared each gate. He jumped each hill perfectly. He navigated the course so as to win. Many people start at the starting gate and look for the problems, never expecting to win. If you have, cle if you have clearly in mind what your objective is and what things you need to accomplish it, Nothing will keep you from reaching that goal. There are many people who almost made their goal. For others, there is no almost no middle ground. For some, there is no partial commitment. Realistic as well as idealistic long-term and short-term goals should be set. A constant reevaluation is needed. Many times I have failed to reach what I set out to do, but I think I'm always a better person for having tried. But failure can be the highway to success. But I don't expect to fail, and I never will expect to fail. There is a lot of tragedy in the word, all, in the word almost. There are many people who, almost, uh, who are almost something. Almost sounds so very near to accomplishment, but yet so far away. 
How often someone uh, gets close enough to say, I almost finished my degree. I almost got that scholarship. I almost got the job I wanted. I almost got a good husband. I almost succeeded. The story is told about the first racehorse to win a million dollars in prizes for its owner. In the particular race which made the winner a millionaire, there was another horse who came in second. The second place horse had consistently finished close to the leader race after race, but his initial earnings were only $75,000. The also ran was almost as good as the champion, never farther behind than a length or two, and yet, and yet the, ch the champion had won 13 times as much money. He was not 13 times as fast. He was not twice as fast. He was not even 2% faster. Just a nose or a length in a mile. The extra effort does make a difference. So now back to our friend Sir Edmund Hillary. Sir Edmund Hillary and you and I are in many ways just ordinary kinds of people. We are okay students in many cases, we are okay athletes, and we have modest abilities, and sometimes we even fail. But I want you to remember this. Great things are accomplished by ordinary people who are motivated. Motivation is a spark that makes an average person great. Our dreams should be full of adventures. Our falls should be followed up by get-ups and renewed focus. Our desires to succeed should stretch us to the utmost, and our planning should lead us to success. So one final thought. It's kind of an analogy. The eagle gently coaxes her offspring towards the edge of the nest. Her heart quivered with conflicting emotion, emotions as she felt their resistance to her persistent nudging. Why does the thrill of soaring have to begin with the fear of falling, she thought. This ageless question was still unanswered for her, the eagle. As is the tradition of the eagle, her nest was located high on the shelf of a sheer rock face. Below, there was nothing but air to support the wings of each baby eagle. It is, possi is it possible this time it will not work, she thought. Despite her fears, the eagle knew it was time. Her parental mission was all but complete. There remained one final task, the push. Okay, thank you so much, and good luck to you on life. So let me talk to you about something I really know, which is investing. How about that? I can tell you a little bit about so uh, I'm going to open it up for questions, uh, but um, here's what I do all day and every day is we talk to people about investing uh, their money. And to most rich people, next to their children and families, the money is the most important thing they've got. It's it maybe out of whack, but I don't question that with them. Uh, so we talk about, we talk to them about investing money, how to allocate their assets, uh, how to preserve their capital. Most of them sell a business and we meet them when they're 60 years old and they have 100 or $200 million. Interestingly enough, our, our, the age of our clients is dropping because uh, people are starting businesses at 30 and selling at age 35 and 40 and at 42 and making a few hundred million. It's not the real world, by the way. I don't want everyone to think you can start a company and in two years sell it for a billion. I want you to think you can do that, but it's not the normal way. So our clients sell a business, come to us, and our usual goal for them is preservation of capital. So we talk about how to do that, asset allocation, diversification, and we spend our day talking to them about uh, um, growth versus value, income, stocks versus bonds, private equity, real estate, all that kind of stuff, because that's what we do at our firm. Um, we have 50 people, and we have a lot of clients, and they're smart people. So it's very stimulating every day, and I love going to it, and, and I've been doing it 38 years, and don't regret uh, many days of doing it. I regretted the day that Goldman Sachs went public, as we had left two years before. And uh, we'd have probably participated in that, but we, we did okay. So, 
So I'm happy to talk to you about our outlook. I can tell you whatever you want. But do you have any questions you want to raise or talk about? Sir. For a student, yeah. So for a college student, how do you recommend getting started? Um, look, I think uh, the best way to do it is just to do it. And the power of compounding interest will astonish you. And I didn't say it, um, but the, the most powerful force in the universe is compounding rates of return. And um, uh, so, Look, you choose to put $50 a month away, put $25 a month away, whatever you can afford, and start. I would probably suggest you put it in mutual funds. That way you get diversification. And I'd go pick a large cap, U.S., high quality uh, mutual fund, and I'd put 50 bucks a month in it, and I'd just keep doing it. And you don't need bonds because you're too young. You want growth. And over time, stocks will always outperform bonds, except for the last 10 years, frankly. But it's the first time in history bonds have outperformed stock for a long period of time. But I don't see that happening anymore, because we had 30 years of a bull market and interest rates from 1982. Rates have gone straight down for 30 years. That's not going to happen anymore. We're on the other side of that. Rates will start to go up for the next 30 years, maybe, or for some period of time. But that's what I would do is discipline, put your money in every month, and put in a large cap uh, U.S. And, and until you get enough, and then you know, pick a mid cap and put some money into that kind of thing. Easiest way to get safety and diversification. It'll go up and down, but over time, and time's on your side, because you're young. Good question. Sir. What's uh, my thought about quantitative easing and how it affects bonds? Um, um, look, the, the Fed has been involved in quantitative easing for a period of time now, and uh, they were the most buying 85 billion bonds a month. Uh, what they're doing is they're buying a 10-year treasury and trying to force interest rates lower to stimulate uh, uh, real estate, to stimulate the um, uh, to uh, the price of real assets, let's say that. And it's worked. Lower interest rates and quantities of easing have, have uh, um, stimulated the price of real assets. Real assets meaning stocks, real estate, um, art, collectible cars, all that stuff. The unfortunate thing is it's not the people who work at Walmart, and I don't say that in a negative way, who own that stuff. It tends to be those people who have more money. So the unfortunate thing about what the Fed has done is the people who are rich have gotten richer. And the gap, which you should be talking about in your class, is the gap between the haves and the haves not is bigger. Now, um, and that's part of some government policies as well. That's a whole other discussion for an hour. But, uh, and uh, so we need to think about that gap. But, um, quantitative easing is kind of interesting. They started quant they announced it in May of last year. Interest rates went up 100 basis points before they ever did anything about it. So the market anticipates it always. This year, uh, they've, they've cut it three times now. They've reduced the amount of money they're buying. And this, the bond market hasn't done a lot. It's actually, uh, interest rates are a little bit lower. The year, the 10-year was 3%, then it got as low as 260, and now it's 280 or something today. So, look, I don't think interest, I think it's going to be the big surprise of the year that interest rates are not going to go up like people feared. I think interest rates will stay lower than people think for longer than people think. Because the economy is still fragile and can't sustain higher rates. And that's what I believe, and I think... Um, I don't think it's a disaster. I think they could have backed out of the market, not told anyone, stop buying any bonds, and the market wouldn't have known the difference. But they don't do that. So does that answer your question? Yeah. I think interest rates will stay low. Someone else had a question. Yeah. Sir. So uh, would you recommend paying off debt uh, before investing or doing both together? Paying off debt before you invest. I have a lot of debt. Um, I have mortgages on real estate, so uh, 
Look, uh, it's different when you're a, a student. Debt can be a killer. Debt will keep you and your wife awake all night long. Debt uh, uh, will cause you to do things you don't want to do, take risks you don't want to take. I don't know what you're referring to specifically, but um, there has to be a, uh, some kind of uh, debt you're going to take out. You're going to buy a home, you're going to have debt. I don't believe in uh, buying diamond rings on, de for de on debt. I don't believe in that. I don't believe in buying, putting a lot of money in a car and having a lot of debt. Consumer things is like a debt horse dies and you're still paying for it. So um, I would advise you to have less debt for consumers' consumption stuff. But if you want some investment debt and you're going to buy a home, or you're going to buy a duplex, and you're going to invest in it, that's different. Student loans, I don't know if that's what you're referring to. Uh, they're pretty reasonable. So you have to have some thought as to how you pay those off. And you can pay those off over time because the government is pretty friendly on that. And they'll continue to stay friendly because it's a good social purpose. So I don't know if I'm ask, answering your question. Be careful for, what, for, what, for why you go into debt. That's what I would say. Consumer, I'd pay it off. Because if you don't, you're carrying a credit card, and that interest rate on that credit card is, I don't know, 18% or some crazy thing. I wouldn't have a credit card that I didn't pay off every month. So that's, that's another thing that'll kill you and eat you alive is that credit card debt. And you're all sitting back there saying it's easy for me to say, but you know, it's still very, very expensive debt. Other questions? A second one from this guy. You only get five, you know. Okay. <laughs> Sure. How would you advise them to hedge themselves against the diversity gap? Like, how should they meet the base steps now before they get to college and a couple years after college to be able to help themselves financially jump the diversity gap where you are no longer a have not to have from a have not to have? From a have not to a have? Yeah. <laughs> Look, for me, it was my graduate school. If I hadn't gone to graduate school, so I'm going to say this in general. Stay in school as long as you can. It's easier in school than it is out of school. Just remember that. Years ago, Reed Halliday told me that. So stay in school as long as you can. Get your undergraduate, get your grad MBA, get your graduate degree, get your PhD, like Dean over here, you know. I say that in jest, but look, school's a wonderful time. It's, you should be having a lot of fun and enjoying it. And uh, it, it frankly is, even though with the stress of it, it's actually easier to be in here than out in the real world slugging it out. But I think the key is whether you're um, an immigrant and you came across the border and you're trying to make it happen. As I tell all the kids in our Spanish ward in our building in Southern California, look, you guys, you got to finish high school. That's what we're focused on. you got to finish high school. And then we got to get them to the local college, and one out of 50 will come to BYU or UVU, and you have to, we have to give them the money to do that. But it's the education that's going to make the difference. I think, in general, that's the big thing. Look, I'm going to tell you the other way I think makes a difference is when you look for a job, and I've told Soren and his brother and his sisters, what you're looking for is someone who can teach you the business. You're, you want a mentor. And less the, so when you're gonna interview, and you're gonna interview at Ford, and Procter and & Gamble, and uh, Caterpillar Tractor, and they're all, they'll come here, or you'll seek them out. The first question you ask them is not what are you gonna pay me, but look, who am I gonna work with? Who's gonna teach me the business? If you get a guy or a gal who can mentor you, and take you under their wing and teach you the business. That's all you care about. And you don't say to them how much you make. You just say, I'll tell you something. If you teach me the business, I'm the hardest worker you've ever known. I'll do whatever you want. I'll get you coffee. I'll wash your car on the weekends. Teach me the business so that I know what you know and transfer that knowledge into my head. And, uh, and you'll be successful. And the money will flow. It'll follow what you're doing. But you got to have someone. When you go to work at that place, you want to know who's going to teach you the business. 
and you lob onto them, you attach yourself to their side. And don't give up until he teaches you everything he knows and you'll be successful. That's my advice. Kind of plain and simple, but that's what I do. What else? You're not talking, you guys. Anything else? We're almost, to, you know, we got five minutes, but um, I could tell you about the stock market again, but we don't need to know that. You're knowing it. Look, uh, good luck to all of you. I wish you the best. Uh, you're in good hands here. I can't tell you how, uh, how it is, how exciting it is to be at this place. And I just went through the new uh, physical, what do you call it, physical, uh, physical ed building? It's a student center. Student life, student life center. If you haven't, you know, it's going to open one of these first days. Uh, it's free to you, costs you $5 or something. I think for the Paxmans who are 95, I think it's $10 <laughs> for, per month. But you, they got all these facilities. I've never seen anything like it. It's, it's a fabulous facility. So uh, anyway, that you're lucky to have all that kind of stuff here. Thanks for coming, and thanks for being part of our, of our lecture series. Sure appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank